All right, we have the green light, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. Hello there. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Elaine Fiore. I'm an environmental educator with Broward County Public Schools in South Florida, where I teach about school uh, sustainable food systems through our school food forest program, and I also do work in school food recovery. The other hat I wear is coordinating Food Waste Prevention Week, which some of our rock star team members are here today. Um, really excited about our discussion today. We're going to be kind of delving into school food waste and what it looks like, what, how much waste our schools actually have, and what some of the solutions are. Uh, while we realize it or not, a lot of the social norms that our children are learning, they are learning in our school cafeterias from their peers. And I can remember being a kid, elementary school, I'd take out my lunch, my mom made me peanut butter and jelly on Roman meal, wheat bread, and I'd look around at everyone else and they had Wonder Bread and I was like, I wish I had Wonder Bread like all the other kids. So while, right, yeah. So while some of the decision, in my case, the decision on what I wanted to eat was being influenced by my peers, um, some of the behaviors that the children have are being reinforced in their school cafeterias. So, and I would venture to say that behaviors like uh, conserving and valuing food are not being taught in our school cafeterias unless the school has a share table where they could place the excess food. So um, the norm that they, the majority of our kids are learning is that excess food, we're teaching them that excess food is to be treated as trash. The good news is though, we have our panel here today and uh, there's a couple reasons why we're really excited about talking about kids in schools and food waste. And the first reason is that if we want to have systemic change, we need to engage all of our stakeholders. And if you look at the population of students in our K through 12 schools across the country, we have 50 million uh, K through 12 kids. So I'm really happy that we are placing a priority on student engagement. The second reason is that kids are an untapped resource. How many of you have children? Okay. Um, how many of you have ever had your kids come home from school, they've just learned something new, and they're like, oh no, we cannot do this any longer, we have to do it this way instead, right? So really, kids are almost a two for one. Number one, we're educating the next generation so they will have positive, they'll have behavior change in conserving food, and they're also key in educating their parents. So today, we have a great lineup. I'm going to have the, um, our panelists introduce themselves, their organization, and tell us a little bit about the work they do around food waste, and then we'll start delving into some of the questions. So I'll start with you. Hello, is this on? I am uh, Alex Nicholson Wesa with the World Wildlife Fund, and I have a daughter who I also make eat wheat bread on her sandwiches and get told is not, she's not appreciate it. Um, uh, I work with, I help to support our work through our Food Waste Warriors program, which many of you here have also supported and we're, we're so proud of. Um, and we work with, with K through 12 schools across the country, um, primarily Title I schools, uh, to help them really turn, as our tagline says, cafeterias into classrooms to really help them understand where their food comes from and how reducing food waste can also uh, reduce how the food system today also really affects some of their favorite animals, some of their favorite habitats, really making that food system connection and giving them really a tangible way to take action on food insecurity, on climate change, and again, on habitat loss. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Elnikib. I'm with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in New Jersey. And I'm um, on the Rutgers Corporate Extension food waste team. We do a lot of like K-12 education um, and we just developed the New Jersey Leaves No Bite Behind curriculum, which includes video games for kids on food waste, which I'm really excited to share. Um, and, uh, you know, we've really worked a lot with, you know, um, K through 12 schools to look at ways, you know, different levers to reduce waste. So starting with cafeteria workers, uh, moving into school administration and now talking to kids. And so we're very excited to, to like kind of share our resources and share the stories that we've learned and 
and happy to help you know folks who are interested in doing this work with you know in your state. So, cool. hi everyone, um, welcome to the second to last session of the entire conference. Um, we're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Caitlin Harper. I use she/her pronouns. I am a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and in Baltimore, Maryland. And so I did my dissertation research in food security work. And so that's kind of the background that I bring into this. And I, since I graduated, which was last year, I've started working on food waste issues. And so I'm working um, with WWF on an upcoming study that is looking at school food waste um, and reducing school food waste through share tables in four different districts around the US. Um, and can talk a little bit more about that later, but excited to be here. Okay, well, we'll start delving into the questions. Uh, for context, I mentioned I'm an environmental educator. My sustainability class did a school food waste audit, and we did two, We did a couple different types, but the easiest one is you just take a cart and you put it by the garbage can, and anything that was unopened or unpeeled, they put in the cart. So if they were just throwing one applesauce away, they didn't really think about it, but at the end of the all the lunches, there were two carts, and we're a relatively small school, about 700 students. There were over 300 food items, and that was just lunch that were being thrown away. Multiply that by 180 days, that's 52, oh, and uh, yeah, we had 52,000 food items from our school. Broward County Public Schools is the sixth largest district in the country. We have 220 schools, so that's over 11 million food items just from our district. And then our kids looked at, oh, well, Florida, we have 4,000 schools. So the, just the number keeps increasing and increasing. And uh, I'd like to pose this question. How much can one of you tell us how much food waste, how much food really goes to waste in the United States? Um, so, and I'm, maybe I should have Melissa talk to this. Um, feel free to chime in. But uh, back in 2018, thanks to the Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation, we did a pilot in nine cities and roughly 46 schools. And we, exactly as you said, part of it was going in and doing these audits with kids that really helps them understand the issue. You can PowerPoint them to Dash and tell them how bad food waste is, eat your vegetables, but like when they go in and see this piled up and you're separating out what's being thrown out and then from there taking those samples <coughs> and, and generalizing that across the 100,000 or so schools in the National School Lunch Program, I believe it was around 530,000 um, or 45, 430, 530,000 um, tons, I'm sorry, of food waste a year across all schools in the U.S. was our estimate. Melissa, tell me if I'm wrong there. Okay. That's right. Nine point, I'm going to repeat that aloud. $9.7 million per day, which is... And that's excluding crazy. milk. That's excluding milk waste. Okay. Right. Um, the number is, uh, that including milk, found uh, on So those numbers obviously are astronomical. Um, and, oh yeah, and can I can just say one more thing about that? The beauty of that was without being prescriptive, and we're gonna get into some of the specific things that you can do to reduce, reduce food waste as we talk about this, but just the idea of measuring, I mean it just, it really helps people, again, visually understand it. People want to do something about food waste and just that alone and doing the measurement as the study found, help those schools reduce food waste across all age groups by 3%, but just elementary schools, it was closer to 12%. And so again, they, they will come up with, and that really kind of sets in motion, what can we do about this? So, but first just getting that measurement so that you can manage the issue. Yeah, having those numbers, that's what drives. Parents see those numbers, uh, the Food Nutrition Services see those numbers, and you know, with the momentum building, they're, they feel impelled to act. So what, we have so much food waste in our schools. What are some of the reasons that food, so much food is being wasted? And we're just, we're not talking about the kitchen end because food nutrition services are pretty tight on that. We're talking about on the student side. Yeah, I can start. Um, actually, I wanted to ask also, who here works directly in schools, either, either as an educator or as a community partner or, 
Great. Yeah. So you all know how complicated it is. Um, yeah. So like Elaine said, we're focused on the student aspect of it, right? The, the kind of front of house. But we will say that the back of house stuff also impacts it, right? There are things like um, the cafeteria workers who are strapped for time because lunches go really, really quickly and they have to fit a lot of students in a very short amount of time. So they're doing a lot of prep, right? And that prep influences what the things look like that the kids are picking up. Uh, it's influencing the kinds of foods that kids are getting, um, which ultimately influences what kids will or will not eat. Um, and I think that, so part of it is, you know, a structural thing on that end. And then there's also other structural things like what are kids used to eating, right? And obviously kids have certain preferences anyway because they are kids and that is biological, but also thinking about those issues of what they have access to in their homes. And so we have 44 million kids that are utilizing the school uh, meals programs and 34, of the, 34 million of those are um, using free and reduced price lunches. And so these children are may be living in households that don't have regular access to um, healthy foods. And so thinking about the nutrition standards that are set in schools, which are a good thing, right? We want our kids to be eating healthy foods in schools, but they might not be the things that kids are used to eating, right? And so they see these things and they're tasting these things and they don't want them, right? Um, and we can get into solutions later, but sneak preview, student engagement. Um, so I'll leave it there, I'll pass it on to Sarah. Um, so also not only like our kind of the changes in the you know uh, quality and kind of types of food that kids are eating, but it's also their ages really matter. So kind of Alex kind of talked a little bit about how elementary school kids tend to waste more, right? And so you know they tend to eat less. If you have a kid, you know sometimes they eat a lot, sometimes they don't eat at all, and that's kind of how they regulate their bodies, and that's fine. Um, and so the idea is that knowing that in advance and kind of trying to work with that and then also like dexterity matters and, and not a lot of times people think about this but like um, kind of like Kelly was saying like the you know lunch rooms are, are lunch times are tight there's not a lot of time to kind of prep food so oftentimes we see in like food waste audits like an orange that was just bitten into it because the kid really wanted an orange but they don't can't peel it because they're a kindergartner you know and so this idea of just like quartering oranges or you know oranges. Yeah, like, and so like this idea of like just making things like more accessible for kids, it's so simple, but it makes a huge difference for, you know, reducing waste and making sure that the foods that they're getting, they're actually eating, which is the point, right? Um, so those are just kind of some of the other underlying issues of why food waste happens in schools. Yeah, that's a really good point, and I'd, I've had done cafeteria duty many a times, and I've had the littles raise their hand, and they're like, Miss, Miss Fiore, can you please help me unpeel my orange? And I, of course, I don't mind doing that, but in some places, they're like, oh, you should not be touching the kid's food, and so there's different, different norms around that. Um, okay, so those are some of the challenges that we see. Uh, what are some examples of initiatives or strategies to reduce food waste in schools? I can start. That's fine. Cool. Um, all right. So I, I'm going to break them into like three different buckets, the ones that uh, have a lot of evidence, the ones that have some evidence, and the ones that need more evidence. Um, but before I do that, I should say that there's overall very, very limited research around food waste itself in schools. I think there's been a ton of research around increasing consumption. Um, and you might think that, you know, it is intuitive to think if we increase consumption, then we will decrease waste. And that is partially true, but not always true. Um, Sarah was giving me this example right before this of, you know, if you give kids a bigger scoop of, you know, a certain fruit or a vegetable, then they are more likely to eat that thing, but they're also more likely to waste some because they'll leave some on their plate, right? And so, um, the studies that are looking at consumption don't always measure food waste, and so we don't actually have those numbers. Um, we do have a, a fair amount of qualitative studies, um, thinking about interviews or focus groups with folks about some of the reasons why food waste occurs in schools, but less of those studies still on what actually works. Um, so the studies that I was going to lay out for you are about, um, or the research that I can lay out for you is more about increasing consumption. So just wanted to put that out there first of all. Um, 
And so some of the things that have strong evidence, like Sarah was saying, is pre-cutting fruits and vegetables. That's really helpful for kids. Um, we also know that those policy changes around rece recess before lunch really helps um, increase consumption and having longer lunch periods, just giving kids time to eat their food. Um, and so those are really helpful. And then also increasing the palatability of food and, and having that student engagement and, and having kids involved in that. Um, kind of going along with that is taste tests, and that's in the like, there is some evidence for this, but we need more studies on it. Um, as well as nutrition education, we know that education is really important. We also know that it can't be the only factor that decreases food waste and increases consumption in schools. Um, and then more recently, uh, bulk milk dispensers has been something that people have been testing, and this has also shown a lot of promise, um, but more studies are really needed there. Um, and I know that we talked about share tables, and share tables is one that uh, we actually need, we know that anecdotally it works, and we've seen it, and lots of people have implemented them, um, but there is not a lot of hard research out there that says that this is actually, that shows the numbers of this is actually reducing food waste. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and, and let you all add too. I want to build on a couple of those. I mean, some of this is about right sizing because we talked about like, the difference between, you know, a 15-year-old versus like my daughter who's six. Like when you when you pre-cut up those fruits and vegetables, they can take a little more of only what they want. And same with the bulk milk. That's really it's very intuitive. They don't have to go and I mean, and then if a student who's 16 wants to have a couple glasses of milk, they can do that. So it's really right sizing it based to the amount that they'll actually take. Um, and then I also think that, again, it's, it's easier said than done. We, we often know, like, this is what the research will show, but to go and adjust bell times, like any of you here who work in schools, to say, why are kids eating at 10.30 in the morning? Like, why don't you just make it afternoon? It's so simple. It's not simple to, to make that adjustment, and we understand that. But, I mean, it's very intuitive to know that if someone has, if the kids have gone out and been active and run around, and then they have enough time to eat, not just being after they're active, right, more of the food will be consumed. So, again, it, what we're really looking at as far as interventions, too, it's, it's, it's sometimes we know what it is on paper academically, but actually implementing this, going through all of the hurdles, right, the short staffing, right, the lack of funding, um, the policies that you run into that are different and, and different districts, that's part of what we're trying to work through to see if there are best practices on the implementation front, but I think we'll get into that. Yeah, and it is, uh, I totally agree, kids, sometimes kids do not have enough time to eat. They have 30 minutes. If they bring their lunch, they go to the table and then they have time to eat. If they're not bringing their lunch, they have to go through the line. Um, then they, for some of the kids, that's their time to chat with their friends. They want to socialize. So they're chatting and they're eating and then they really don't have that much time to finish their food. And I would just like kind of like snap on the um, kind of milk this, you know, dispenser thing because milk is the number one thing we see as waste, no matter what, what age and what school, right? We've seen like a lot of milk waste um, throughout kind of our food waste audits, at least in, at Rutgers. And so I definitely think that just that one solution is, is hugely impactful. And then another uh, thing that uh, we're trying to test out, um, so in the curriculum for the New Jersey Leaves No Bite Behind is really looking at like, does like climate change education impact you know f food waste? And so if we really like tie it into um, climate and try to think about you know the age that you know students or kids are starting to be like advocates for climate, um, that's kind of what we're testing out. And so hopefully we'll have some results on that soon, and we'll share it out. But that's definitely like a place that we want to see if new climate education can impact um, some of that you know food waste reduction. Sarah said for one more thing, with bulk milk, it's not just about the liquid waste, it's also about the material waste that comes along with those cartons, and so it can be a win-win in that front by helping to reduce all of that and you know the, the contamination that takes place of that when you're doing the recycling of milk cartons. The second, when we talk about like educating on climate change, there's been there isn't robust, but there's good research too on on how connecting kids in with where their food comes from through like farm to schools programs as well. Again, this is something you'd love to do more of, but there's always way more interest than there is funding um, for schools to take that on. But you know this with the food forest, right? Helping students understand, you know, oh, this is where food comes from. Again, it, it, they're a little bit more invested, right? And and so um, that's shown that actually can increase fruit and vegetable consumption, decrease waste. But again, these are 
very easy said, but like also bringing a bulk milk dispenser, like why don't we all just go do that? Well, you also have to have dishwashing equipment. You have to have the upfront investment, right? So because we looked at that at our our district as well, and they don't have they removed the dishwashers, uh, and so you're right. Part of the infrastructure needs to be changed. And I am glad that you mentioned the milk. A lot of the kids and the teachers still think that kids are required to take milk, and they're not. They're they are required to take three food items, and one needs to be a fruit or vegetable, and they set the three because based on what the child's caloric needs are, that way they'll get the calories they need for the day. So that's where some of some of the waste co does come from. So educating the kids that, you know what, you don't need to take milk. We'll have less well, milk waste. And, sta oh, yeah. and staff yes, on and things staff like an yes. offer, ver an offer versus serve, right? right? Yeah, so exactly. Okay. What are some examples of some initiatives we've heard you talk about? I was excited to hear about these games, too. Yeah. Uh, some of the strategies and initiatives that you guys have uh, for reducing food waste. Um, so we really, our team started with, like, uh, educating the food service staff. Just, you know, like, it started as in, like, 2017, we, I was doing a food safety, you know, just, like, hand washing, time and temperature control, and the food service workers were complaining about how much food they're throwing out, and the kids aren't eating it, and it's, you know, all of this hard work and effort is going into this food, and and so I was like, I told the food service director, I was like, hey, why don't we measure how much food waste is happening, right? And so we started doing, like, kind of food waste audits, and we just implemented things like, um, kind of, um, Caitlin was talking about with, like, cutting the fruits and vegetables, having hot and cold vegetables, having, you know, um, fresh and canned fruits, you know, just making it, you know, a variety, making sure we teach them about offer versus serve, that they don't have to take all the food items, things like that. And we found that we reduced food waste by about 14%. Um, and then we kept, you know, trying that out in different schools. And we saw consistently it was around like 10 to 14% reduction. And then um, we, uh, then after that, we decided to tackle the principals, right? So we started talking to principals about changing the times, adding five minutes to lunch, and, and maybe like alternating who goes to gym, you know, to recess first um, based on the day of the week so that those kids who are in recess last, you know, get to eat um, a little bit more, uh, things like that to kind of really support some of that. And then finally, uh, we went back and we started talking to students, right? And so it just feels like there's so many stakeholders within the school system that you can engage. And so we started, we started with an EPA grant and COVID it happened and so obviously that whole grant <laughs> fell apart but we got lucky and we got uh, funding from NJDEP and they really were like you know New Jersey became the first state to require k-12 education in climate change so we're now teachers were looking for climate change education um, and we know that fifth grade is like a really great time for like advocacy right that's when they become really passionate about the environment their health or the world right and so we figured so we developed this curriculum, the New Jersey Leaves No Bite Behind curriculum for fifth grade students, and we wanted to make it entertaining, exciting, and at, at the same time educational. And so it, it consists of like videos and then experiments that you do in class. So the whole point is that one, once we tested it and per, like um, revised it, we were trying to send it out to all New Jersey schools so that they can just kind of t use the videos and use the lessons, and then to kind of make them do homework after school to make it the lessons kind of um, you know sink in. We decided to make video games, and so those video games, um, and they, we also have a card game for like the food food system and like all the inputs and outputs of a food system, and if you change certain like variables, you know what inputs come out, what outputs. So it's really fun, and it's all of this was like ideas from our undergraduate students and our like, community partners who really helped us kind of develop this. Um, but it, like we're getting feedback now, and, and it's been really, really great. And so we're really excited to kind of this summer revise it based on the process evaluation um, and then share it out in the fall. Um, but it, yeah, we have it's, it's been really, really fun kind of just developing them and, and being part of this process. Yeah. And is this something that you might be able to share with us yeah. once you have it out? Yeah, okay, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we'll put it on the Food Waste Prevention Week website. <laughs> 
Can I add yeah. something really quick? Yeah, um, I think that that's so fun and I want to play those games. Um, and also, I think there's some value in thinking about, like you were just saying that fifth grade is a great age to, to target and thinking about how we can cater to like all of the grades. I think right now a lot of the food waste um, education and also food waste efforts are going into the elementary and middle schools and we're not thinking about the high schools. Um, and the high schools obviously are, are complicated for a number of reasons. One is that kids like can go off campus or are eating other things or or simply choose to not eat more so than younger children. Um, but there is still a lot of food waste happening. And so I think that we need to think about how we can engage our teenagers. Um, and one way that Baltimore City Public Schools is trying to do that in this upcoming year is that they're hiring an intern this summer to ramp up their social media. Um, and as we all know, teenagers love social media. And so, um, you know, TBD on how it and how effective it is. But I think it's a it's a cool way to think about and and just I want to put that out there in the world that we need to think about our teenagers and our high schoolers as well. I, well said. I want to build on that, um, which is that one of the opportunities that we've seen is really to engage them almost as a leadership opportunity for older students to then go and mentor and engage and teach this issue to middle and elementary schools. And so just to give one quick example, um, in Maryland, you know, we had a group of, they just, they actually just won an award for this nationally. They, they should be here, not me. Like they, the three students in high school um, that we had been working with went and worked with 10 different elementary schools. They then, um, they went in, they did, they did waste audits. They were, they were setting up uh, composting and looking at setting up shared tables. And then they had students across the whole state write postcards. And so if you're in kindergarten, you're like my daughter, you could just draw a picture maybe. If you're older, you could say why you want there to be policy change. So it's not, it's, it's a way that's tangible in their communities to, again, like I said earlier, address climate, right? I guess address food insecurity. Um, you know, this generation is incredible, Gen Z, in their activism and their willingness to say no, like we're, this, isn't, this isn't acceptable. And so I think food waste is one of those issues where, I mean, you're not going to get a lot of pushback, right? It's just about kind of going against business as usual and the inertia. Most people can get behind this. It's just about figuring out the right framing. Is it a climate issue? Is it food insecurity? And so in this case, these students, through that postcard campaign and meeting with legislators, they were able to pass a state law that is now going to provide regular funding for more schools to be able to teach about food waste and the food system as a whole. And so really powerful, to Caitlin's point, right, to give them a channel for them to do this, right? Right. And then uh, before the food waste, I was involved with ocean conservation. And there was a strong movement with the high, middle school and high school students and the youth in reducing our plastics in the ocean. So that could be something to consider looking at how that movement worked and right. taking some of those strategies in, in this movement with food waste. Um, okay, so we're talking about student engagement. How, what are some ways, we talked a little bit about it, but what are some other ways that we can engage our kids? Because we need their buy-in. If we're gonna change, they're the stakeholders as well. If we're gonna implement behavior change, they need to be part of the solution. Yeah, I can start. So building off of my last point, one way that we're trying to, I mean, because when we first started this, I will say that when we engaged students, it was really about getting them to kind of viscerally understand this, to go in, start those audits as sort of the launch point, and then letting them determine, hey, what's the best way in our school for our community to really address this? But we're coming in and trying to be a little bit more prescriptive now, starting as we, we don't, the research's not perfect, but we're getting more to know what are the more evidence-based interventions. And so I think everyone here raised their hand and said they're either working in a school or they maybe have kids that go to a local school. And so I think a, a way to engage them is first and foremost, you can go in, you can do one of these audits. There's free materials from WWF, um, from, from many others to go in and just talk about, you know, this issue as a starting point. Um, but then I would say, you know, I, I think personally one that you can typically get school administrators behind um, is just again a launching point is the share tables because again there's food and not all foods right are going to be appropriate right off the bat. There's some no pun intended low hanging fruit to go after and then from there you can say well we can't obviously redistribute this through students just in our school let's donate this back to the community, right? Or there's gonna be food that isn't safe to donate. Can we compost this? Can we use it to start our food forest or our, right, our school garden, right? So I think that can be a launching point. We've found that, you know, especially coming out of the pandemic with everyone stretched, with, you know, cafeterias just in, in utter chaos, right? If you're going in and you're saying, hey, let's take on the issue of food waste, you sort of get some 
I don't have time for this, right? But if you talk about it as, look, this is about helping to address the food, the food insecurity crisis, there's a little bit more, oh, tell me more. So that's just one idea that I see that any of us here can really start to engage that in, in local schools. Yeah, and I, I think I would add on to that last piece about tying it into food security and tying it into wellness. A lot of schools have um, like wellness committees or wellness initiatives or things like that. And I think um, sometimes we come in as researchers and organizations and partners and we want to do top down things and we want to tell the students what to do. And I think that there is a place for having youth advisory boards in those wellness councils um, and including youth in those conversations and having them actually be the decision makers because they're the one, they're the knowledge experts, right? They have lived experience. And so um, we want to make sure that we are engaging them fully in this process and taking their ideas and actually implementing those ideas. And obviously there's going to be, you know, some, some pushback or some structural things that young people don't understand and that's part of that too is part of that give and take of, of educating them as well and figuring out solutions to um, those those structural or institutional barriers um, and and working together to solve those problems okay. all right um, we have what is needed to catalyze progress in the future you started to talk a little bit about that looking at engaging all the stakeholders. So I think like we've made really great progress in the US with like this farm to school kind of network and farm to school work. And I feel like, I think it's like low hanging fruit to tap into that, right? Like let's just get in there and, and start like kind of thinking about food waste more like generally, right? Like as a food systems issue. And so if there's a way to connect like the farm to school program to food waste audits and uh, like everyone was saying, like having the kids do the audits, there's nothing, you can talk to them until you're blue in the face, but there's nothing that's gonna beat that visual of that tray, uh, like trays of food on a, you know, a table where they have to weigh and measure it all or like the, all of the excess food, they get curious and they are already thinking, right? Like they start thinking like, why is there so much food? What are you doing? What's going on? Like they really become in excited and interested and then they become the catalyst that you need, you know, them to be in the school. So I think that's definitely one is like trying to tap into like the farm to school movement and trying to trying to expand it into food waste, um, whether it's composting or, you know, share tables or, or whatever that is. And then I think another one that might help, and we're kind of going to see if this works, is this climate change education requirement, right? So New Jersey's first state, maybe other states will follow, and then we'll see if, like, as, you know, climate change is really complicated, and for kids, it's really hard to, like, do anything about it, right? Like, right. it's you, you often talk about, like, solar energy and wind energy and, like, electric vehicles, and that they have no power over any of that, right? But food, they have power over food. <laughs> they can not waste food at their very next meal after you teach them, right? So it's very like tangible for them and something that they um, can feel like they can make a difference. And so really like even empowering them to feel like they can make a difference in climate change and showing them what that means, I think is really, really powerful for them. And so maybe food systems and food waste can be a way to teach climate change that is more accessible for kids. And that might be you know something well said, we well said. Can I just say one more thing on that? I want to build off of both what you said, because I think it is, you know, like I said earlier, right, they have, students are, are, are rightly just outraged that no, that action isn't happening fast enough, let's say, on climate change. And food waste is one of those issues where we've seen students in several states, just to name it, no, you know, just two to name a few, have been able to really gather bipartisan support, right, to say we need action. And you don't have to, again, talk about it as it is a climate issue. We all know this in this room but it doesn't need to be talked about that because in certain places like where I'm from, that's not where you're gonna lead with. And so um, I, I do think to catalyze, to answer your question, it's about letting students lead, as Caitlin said, um, and getting behind this because you really, pe people do listen when it's student, when it's student led versus yes. any of us getting up here and talking, right? And then at the end of the day, it's connecting this to policy changes, right? And so, you know, we can do these programs as one-off, but these students move on, right? There's a lot of change, changeover and turnover in schools, as we all know. And so getting these programs institutionalized, whether that's part of a curriculum or that's, you know, within the USDA, let's say, is some of their, their food and agriculture service learning program or others that, that then prioritize food loss and waste as part of the, the um, uh, farm to school, for instance, right? It has a food loss and waste component that's already very inherent, but can we make it a little bit more explicit? So um, that's the other piece I would say. 
Yeah. And then building again, I love the building. We're just building and building, um, building off what Alex said about policy and thinking about that. Um, obviously there are a lot of initiatives that are happening all around the country and around the world. Um, and, but we need to think about how we can do this on more of like a, we're scaling up for everyone. And I think one of the things that we don't quite know how to do yet is, is that because we don't know the factors that are involved in actually implementing some of these interventions. Um, and so the project that WWF and Johns Hopkins and Case Western University are working on right now is trying to figure out implementation and what are, what are all of the factors involved. And so we're working in different types of school districts. We're working in really large ones. We're working in really small ones. We're working in rural and urban. Um, and we're trying to figure out, we're trying to interview everyone from administrators to cafeteria workers to the, the champion teacher who we know is out there that is leading those efforts at that school to the community partners who come in. And what are all of the things that they need? Um, and what are all of the things that are helping them to implement those interventions and actually track how much food waste um, is occurring in schools. And so hopefully this will be a study that's happening over the next couple of years. But at the end of this, we're really hoping to have some guidelines for schools to be like, listen, if you meet these criteria, these are some things that could help you actually do this. And then tying it back into what Alex said about policy, hopefully some of these things will lead to policy changes. And if we're being real, lead to more funding, right? Because schools are always, always, always strapped for funding. And going back to policy changes or even procedures in our school district, you know, I had first learned about share tables a long time ago, and I didn't think we were allowed to have share tables. And so I found out about the Bill Emerson Act, and so I called the Nutrition Services. I've got great news. There's the Bill Emerson Act, and we could start recovering food. I thought, oh my gosh, we're gonna save the environment. We're gonna feed kids. This is gonna be wonderful. They're like, oh, that's all well and good, but we have to adhere to the health department, and unless we have the health department policy, we can't do anything. And I was like, oh, I felt kind of deflated. I was like, well, oh. I thought of them as an obstacle. I'm like, oh, food nutrition services, they're not letting us do share tables. However, they were part of the solution because they're a stakeholder. We got the health policy from them, got them on board, and then our district was able to put procedures in place to make sure that, you know what, we're all partners in this. They were afraid that some of the food was not going to be, it was not going to be safe for the kids to eat, so we made sure that the share table was iced and kept under 41 degrees, and we got a, some infrastructure is needed. We got a refrigerator so we could put the excess food there, and then kids uh, after school athletics, they could go eat from it. And then anything remaining, we donate to the to the food pantry, which was worked well. But um, yeah, some I have to go back to some of the things that you were saying. I really think. Go ahead. Can go I ahead. Say one thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing, the reason I also said phenomenal first and foremost. That's exactly what we want. I mean, the reason I said share tables too is that it's not of the different options that you can do, right? There's a little bit less friction and it's not as expensive. Like on average, the schools that we've been working with, and I know this is just an average, but maybe they would need to have, it, and it doesn't have to be this much, but like $500 to get a little energy, uh, energy star mini fridge that you might see like on a college campus, right? And then a rolling cart, so your point, so that you can move it from the cafeteria perhaps then down to where the athletics is taking place after school or an aftercare program. And so again, it's gonna be, I'm not saying this is gonna work in every single district the same way as we know, but um, that's why is it, it's, it's a little bit lower barrier to entry. Yeah, and then to go back to your farm to school, if the norm that we wanna be teaching our children is to conserve food and value food, they learn to conserve and value food when they grow it. So that's part of what I'm excited about the food, the school food forest program. It's a little easier than annual gardening because we're growing the fruit trees and the vines and the ground cover and everything's edible and the pollinators. So kids are learning, oh, I'm gonna eat, we have cranberry hibiscus. So they'll, they'll start, they think it's crazy at first to eat a leaf off of a plant, but then they do it and they, they really uh, kind of get, get into it, so. Can, can I yes. pull on a thread? So I think the, the concept of like schools being scared of like health inspectors is a very real thing. And so um, we, we found an NRDC and refed kind of a health inspector training that we adapted for New Jersey. And like we started training our health inspectors on the fact that, you know, food donation is safe. We can do it with schools. Here are the things that we're doing with schools to make sure that they're safe. So I think like bringing in your health inspector way in advance before you start doing anything like, 
learn from our mistakes. Like that's really important because I think um, you know then they're st you know they they know that you they have buy-in. They know that you're trying to do things right. You're trying to you know keep kids safe. You're not trying to like kind of um, be unsafe. But at the same time, like they understand that this is a really big issue. And so really making sure that they're on the same page and training them and talking to them about your plans to you know do the share table in a safe way is really really important. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to have Melissa Terry come around for some Q&A. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, Melissa will come with the mic. This thing on. Okay, as my tithe for serving this purpose, I'm going to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, number one, I just wanted to shout out the farm to school a component of that. So when we look at the number, $1.7 billion wasted each year, <coughs> it's easy to get... Um, sort of depressed about that number. If you look at it the other way, that's an investment number. So if we weren't wasting that money, it could be going in a budget neutral way into farm to school investments, which is an economic engine, which is a great way to support local farmers, which is a great way to build bipartisan support for these programs. So th the question I have for y'all is, uh, when we talk about these recommended uh, nudges like longer lunch periods, recess before lunch, whatnot. Um, I really appreciate the question about who's ever worked in a school before because uh, the constraint in a school day is that you're federally required to have 360 minutes of instruction time per day. So to change any of that is a, a an ask of a district to change bell times and all that stuff. So my question to y'all is, to what extent do you feel like it's feasible as a potential remedy to lobby for, advocate for, policy push for school lunch periods to legitimately be considered as classrooms and formal instruction time so that <coughs> that is included, that time is included in the 360 minutes per day and then it actually becomes part of the whole bandwidth of the day instead of this wedge that we're trying to shove kids through in the middle of the day. I mean, do I, I would say like feasibility, I can't tell you that. I have not actually, I, I mean, Melissa, that's, of course, I think that's a fantastic idea because then you're changing the game a little bit. You're not trying to, you know, adjust like you were, I mean, very, I, I applaud what you're able to do. Like, can we add just a few more, a little bit more at a time, but, um, I like that sort of paradigm shift. So I can't say I can't speak to the feasibility of it, though. I think that if there were everything standards driven, so I think that if there were a couple of standards that were tied to what's going on in the cafeteria to add that time, that might make it um, an easier ask. Yeah. Yeah, so and just to clarify, so before, sorry, Sarah. There are nutrition minutes that are required in instruction time. Right now, our nutrition education um, in our school district is in PE. And so, like, if PE could stay PE and nutrition time could be allocated, like, you've got math in your math book and you've got nutrition in your lunch tray, mm -hmm. I feel like that, you know, the, the, the required instruction curriculum time is in place, but maybe it's just in the wrong room. So, yeah, so I was going to actually gonna say I came from Head Start, so that's where I started uh, my career as a dietitian. And Head Start, like, it's not as rigorous with the time, but um, we did share table, I mean, um, you have family style meals, and that was instructional time. We taught kids how to share, right? We taught kids how to measure, we taught kids how to pour. I mean, it was, you know, pre K basically, but that, that was instructional time. And so I think, like, if we take that example and, like, kind of expand it to the K 12. Right. If there's a way to include instructional time, and I know like Food Court does amazing work during the lunch periods with like you know taste testing, which is another way to reduce food waste. Right. Taste testing certain foods or like mini nutrition lessons, not complete nutrition lessons. So I think you know it's a way to supplement. So maybe if it's not the full lunch period, but at least part of the lunch periods can count right towards instructional time. I think that's definitely something that we should bring up more and maybe advocate for it together. I think that's important. Yeah, I was just gonna add, I think it's a really cool idea and and also I want to be mindful of the fact that like, uh, whoever said it in the beginning, like kids use their lunch time to socialize and kids, you know, and, and that is also part of the learning, but I wanna make sure that we are 
not taking that away. And I don't think it has to be taken away, but I think that when you think about, when you first think about like uh, adding curriculum or creating an educational space around food um, to somebody who is outside of this world and outside of this space, but trying to gain political support for it, I think that um, we just want to be mindful of like how we present that to them. And also thinking about how, uh, sorry, this is not a fully formed thought, but how adults perceive kids and trust them. And I think that we need to trust that kids are going to learn in an unstructured setting like that um, if we are guiding them. But right now, I think that adults a lot of times think that kids have to be very structured in order to like get the point. And so if we start trusting our kids more and creating those spaces for them to be creative with food in a cafeteria, um, then it could be really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so just to, real quick, the, if it's just like that 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning where your taste test, where you're doing like whatever, it also like uh, is a social justice component with the seated time question as well, and then also kind of validates having a nutrition professional instead of a lunch lady um, in roaming the cafeteria. I don't think many people are aware of how scared kids are in the cafeteria of getting in trouble. Uh, it's actually kind of a tense, I worked in school districts for six years, and that was my job was to be the lunch lady, so it's kind of a scary space for small people who are afraid of getting in trouble and don't feel very supported sometimes. Um, but questions, because we can talk about this all day. <laughs> Thank you for, for a great panel discussion. Um, we do uh, programming in schools as well. We're an environmental nonprofit in the San Diego area. In the beginning, um, I, I understood that you were saying that there's not much information on how much food is wasted. We've actually been doing, uh, we do pre and post audits. Um, so I'd like to connect if anybody's interested. It's more anecdotal because, you know, for our organization, we've probably done maybe 20 schools tops. But it's great to show the schools and to show the sponsoring city uh, who paid for the work uh, what it impact it's having. So just to tell you that's there. Um, salad bars, somebody said cafeteria. Um, the kitchen staff, it's not a big emphasis. We find that there's a lot of education that needs to happen with the kitchen staff. Everything from you, they don't need to take milk cartons to um, the whole salad bar being thrown away afterwards because they're not um, estimating a proper amount of food. And then the final thing, maybe I don't have questions except that I'd love to hear your feedback. <laughs> Tell <laughs> us all I, the I'm knowledge. Educating us, this is good. Go. Um, and the final thing was actually in our experience is junior high is the toughest. Elementary school, they are ready for it. High school, you've got a few of those environmental leaders and they start working with their peers. Junior high school, the kids are just, However, we also find... Yeah, does anyone remember good memories <laughs> from middle school? the continuity is really important. If they've learned it in elementary school, better keep going. Um, otherwise, they, they lose the momentum. Thank so, you. Any Thanks. On those we, we've got just a little bit of time. I will say with share tables, uh, one of the remedies is getting rid of those milk cartons, and share tables become a lot easier. Yeah. Hi, thank you all so much. Um, I work for a small nonprofit in Central Washington with school districts, and the biggest pushback we've had around milk dispensers has been monitoring the portion size. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could speak on any experience or anecdotal evidence around that. You're in Washington? Yeah. Okay, great. I will send you a case. I'm going to send you a report after this, which was a lot of schools in Washington that, that um, that we worked with to kind of aggregate different case studies on bulk milk dispensers. One of the solutions, and this, you know, others chime in here, was that you preset the amount that it will, as you push it in, will, so that you're going to cross that threshold to then get out of the danger zone of that discussion. And then again, if you're a 16 year old and you want to have three glasses of milk, go for it. But at least you hit that, yeah. But others feel free to chime in here. Hi, um, my name is Kendall. I work for Food Forward. We're a nonprofit in Southern California that is a food, food recovery organization, um, specifically plant-based. Um, we only recover fruits and vegetables. And we're currently working with a, um, another nonprofit who, as their exclusive produce supplier um, to schools in Southern California. They work in other states, but in Southern California, we work as their exclusive produce supplier. So they can provide education to kids about healthy food. Um, what's unclear is if there's a connection to the, the reducing of waste as well as the climate impact. 
So I was just curious of any thoughts on how we can engage schools outside of that partnership. If their specific focus is just getting um, getting healthy food to the school, to the children and their families and teaching them teaching them how to eat, versus the other impact the other part of it where is, there is a climate effect um, from re reducing waste. That's unclear. That's happening. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts as a food recovery organization that services a number of communities versus schools. Um, I was just curious to see if you had any sort of thoughts on how we can further engage students. Yeah, so we, so um, I think like something that we have uh, tried to work on is just um, kind of connecting, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought for a second. Um, so I think like something that like we want to try to do is like connect the like plant like based eating and like the food waste as like climate like, like things that students can do to, to improve climate, right? Um, but at the same time, like also talk about food security because uh, like oftentimes in the schools that we worked in, we find that like the food waste happens in the same schools that there are food insecurity. And even while we're doing like the food waste audits, we'd find kids that are saying, hey, if you're gonna throw that out, can I have that? And it like sinks my heart, right? Like, oh my gosh, if we had a share table, that would never have happened, like, you know? And so this idea of like, kind of um, just like empowering the students to kind of like take control within the schools. And, and oftentimes like if they feel like empowered, they'll, they'll you know, speak up and they'll actually kind of connect the dots to like either after school programs or food pantries and other places to kind of like send the food and, and, and kind of uh, spread it. I don't know if that answered your question. I'm sorry, but that's well, what I'm saying. I, just to build on that, I mean, this is, a, this is again kind of a gateway with, with, with food loss and waste, right? Because it, it leads to, to these discussions, like as they've seen in farm to schools and other programs, that if they, are, if they understand and they're actually getting access to pr fresh produce, right? Which in many of these schools, you go in and you start this food for us and students have never had a fresh strawberry before and teaching them, well, first of all, letting them do it in a low risk setting where they can do the taste testing. It's not at lunch when they're around all their friends, per se, and they're, you know, they don't want to be the one that goes first, but having the ability to incorporate those, those spaces, and I'm sure you're already doing some of that if it's about consumption, but shifting to healthier diets, right? Like getting that access, which a lot of people don't have, right, to fresh fruits and vegetables, that's a, I mean, you know this, right? That's a, that's a huge climate benefit. Um, and it, but food loss and waste is a way to say um, you can start that discussion. Climate sustainable diets can sometimes be we have to do it, but it can be sometimes a little bit more controversial to start with. And so giving them that safe space to start that um, is, I think, one way you could make the, the connection. Awesome. Yeah, and then as far as the food waste piece of it goes for age appropriate, like the apples and the oranges and stuff, like their teeth are falling out of their head in elementary school. So slice it up, you know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so I did have a, a, a comment and a question, so I'll start with my comment first. I just wanted to lift up this high school um, student that I met, um, and she was basically carrying her waist um, in a little jar. And I thought that it was like so amazing because she had a goal basically set for herself that she was not gonna have more waste than she could fit in this little container. Mm -hmm. She was also carrying it around with her at school. So she was kind of putting herself out there to let her peers know, you know, her efforts and what she was doing and, you know, how much she was uh, wasting. So I thought that was um, a really good way to, you know, be a leader um, and also to get, you know, peers engaged or at least asking the question like, hey, what is this you're carrying around or, you know. Um, so I think that challenge events and things like that with uh, students and the leadership, like y'all say, are really good opportunities, um, at least for the high school students. And then my question um, is, have you guys seen there a, a decrease, I guess, in food waste with food stations and salad bars since the kids can kind of um, pick their own portions or serving sizes or are you seeing more waste? Yeah, I, I don't know that much, but first of all, cool story. Oh my God, that was so awesome. That was like making me like a little teary. Um, yeah, that's really great. Uh, as far as salad bars goes, I, you can, anyone can correct, can correct me, but I f think that there is actually more waste associated with salad bars, um, which is, I, I don't know what that is. Yeah, like high school. Yeah, high school is like, High schools usually have like multiple stations instead of having like one thing and then the kids can have multiple. And again, it's, yeah. And so that goes back to that like, yeah, exactly. And so that goes back to like that consumption versus waste 
like data presentation. So almost anyone who does like you know food consumption studies in um, nutrition, they measure the food waste, but then they only report consumption. And so for us to figure out if this is actually going to increase consumption and decrease waste, or just b increase both, you know what I mean? That's like the bigger question, and that's why we need more data on this because like. Like, we don't want to say no to salad bars, but we really need more data to say if it's going to, you know. Can I, yeah. can I jump on? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, we do know that having more meal options will increase consumption. We do know that. Right. But. Oh, I know there's more questions. Two seconds. I just want to say I love that idea of what of what the student did. It's we've seen it too, where students lead like the the morning announcements to talk about this because you can't just drop in share tables and drop in composting without engaging students to help. First of all, like understand. So I, I think that's a very clever idea. Awesome. We have time for two more questions. We'll go here and here. Anybody that has questions about Salabar, uh, waste data, practices, whatever, Chef Ann Foundation is your resource. Um, I have kind of a tangential question, so if it's uh, too time consuming, then forget it. But I'm curious in, because we know in the States that a lot of the food waste in the supply chain is happening on the consumer end of things. Caitlin, you started to speak to, like, there are best practices that you've learned from global communities. Do Can you draw any parallels between other, you know, elementary, middle, high schools in other countries, whether it's amount of food waste, food being wasted, or best practices that they have that you think could be brought to the States? I know that I said that. I don't know anything about it. I know a very surface level, so I, I apologize for not, not knowing the answer. Yeah. I mean, so I haven't looked at the data. I haven't looked at the data recently, but I do remember that there was like multiple studies looking at food waste in like Greece and like um, like other like kind of um, countries in Europe and asset and comparing it to the US. And I can't remember right now. I just remember something about like soups and like they had like more like homemade options kind of like that's what i'm remembering but i can't really remember right now i can pull it up there's one case study that comes to mind where in the uk they took this like whole school approach and so the idea was that they were doing back of house right and and looking at the way that they're preparing food and reducing waste or maybe using surplus to then create a new a new product front of house and the way that they were educating students to maybe like take only what they need and to like really understand the connection that we've all been talking about around food waste and the food system and then taking that information and being able to go into their homes and their communities so that it's not just at the school that they're reducing food waste. And I don't remember the stats offhand, but that's something that we've really tried to look at replicating. So that's just one example. Hi guys. <laughs> So um, I had a question about dietary restrictions. So more, it's so much more prevalent now to have dietary restrictions, whether it's allergies or health or cultural. Um, are you guys also looking into the difference of food waste when you do pre-surveys and possibly even do like pre-oriented meals for students versus having something that you think that they might like or can eat and they might not be able to do either? Yeah, uh, most of the school that I have worked with and in um, already account for that. So they're, they usually have a registered dietitian that is on staff and they are thinking about those things. Um, but uh, I've got one if you don't. Um, there's, a, there's a great study that NRDC did in Minneapolis School District and one of the things that they found was that, again, I mentioned this earlier, but doing the taste test, like if we're talking about different types of foods and doing that in a non-lunchtime setting, I know we would love to do it all there, but like at lower stakes, like when you're not there around all your friends so that they can get introduced to that new tofu-based dish or whatever it might be that's an alternative um, so that they're then more likely to take it when it is served versus just dropping it on them and being like, here we go. That often leads to quite a bit more waste, right? For the reasons we could all anticipate. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay. One last research question just for rhetoric, rhetoric purposes, is that I'm so excited about all the universal school meal programs being passed at the state level. I'm hearing some concerns about how that might be a driver for increased food waste. So as a research to my fellows, I would really love to hear further discussion about a comparative analysis between schools that are currently doing community eligibility programs, yeah. which are whole school universal meals per district, so that we can cut that off right at the pass and get some best practices out there. Um, we're out of time. Any further okay, questions? just to sum up, um, 
the our schools are a microcosm for what's going on in our society and if we want to shift our so our their social norms some of these practices need to be in place throughout the country and thank you all for your research for time and for the resources that you're creating for your school districts and thank you all for being here